Then in the fall of 81, he saw a newspaper ad for a guitar player. It had been placed by a band called Metallica. There was an ad in there for uh, lead guitarist wanted, uh, and they had said they were looking for someone influenced by, by Iron Maiden and Motorhead. I just got this phone call from this guy who basically just called up and started talking. I mean, after hello, I don't think I said anything for like the next 10 minutes. It was just going blah, 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 blah. So I go to audition for this band, and I took my amps and everything, and I plugged in, and I'm warming up. He had this shrieking lead sound that would cut through any soundproofing. <laughs> everything just was exploding out of everywhere of him. I said, well, are we going to audition? And they said, no, you got the job. Dave Mustaine believed he'd finally found a place in the world where he fit in. Wow! But his sanctuary would be short-lived. Wow! Next, Mustaine and Metallica duke it out. He was on the road to killing possibly all of us at one point. And later, Dave's dance with death. They took me to an emergency room and then I died. In the fall of 81, future Megadeth frontman Dave Mustaine finally found an artful outlet for his aggression with Metallica. The band was at the cutting edge of a musical revolution called Thrash, a fusion of punk rock and hardcore heavy metal. It was angst and testosterone driven about anarchy and things like that. Four of us were the detonation, the beginning of something that was going to really affect music forever. With songs like Jump in the Fire, Metallica cranked up the oral anger of seminal metal bands like Motorhead, clashing head-on with the glam groups dominating the L.A. music scene. So tell me what you think about glam rock. To me, glam rock stands... Glam means gay L.A. music. We had grown up in L.A. and saw all of the B.S. rock star podium, you know, big wig hairdo stuff, and we were so against any of that. Would you please go out Metallica! Metallica spent a year perfecting their sonic jabs in clubs and studios, proving that their bad boy image was no act. When I would go to rehearsal, I would leave the dogs there to watch the drugs. And, and one, one day I took one of the dogs with me and she put her paws up on Ron McGovney's car and scratched the front panel. The pit bull started jumping on my car, scratching it all up. And I hear James yelling at, at Dave saying, hey, get through your freaking dogs off of Ron's car. And James kicked the dog. Now everyone thinks I kicked James' dog and it wasn't that way. James kicked my dog and that's where we went, don't do this, oh, don't do this or you're gonna get fired. When I hear James yelling at, at Dave, and all of a sudden Dave just came unglued, don't you say this kind of crap about my dogs? Then their nose to nose. Shut up or I'm going to hit you. And then the bass player goes, you hit him, you're going to have to hit me first. And then James goes, you hit him, you're going to have to hit me first. And I said, you win, James. And I belted him in the mouth. Knocked him across the room. I mean, just, I mean, he wasn't even expecting it. And the bass player shot me and I flipped him. He threw me against the wall like a big judo throw. And we just got into get out of here, you're out of the band, you know? All right, F you, blah, blah, blah. And then goes in, packs up all this stuff, leaves, comes back the next day. Can I be back in the band? You go, all right, okay, you're back in the band. Dave was uh, pretty much a Jekyll and Hyde. That started perpetuating the Dave's an asshole rumor because as far as anybody knew, I was just a, you know, a badass on guitar that liked to fight and drink. Well, it just got worse. Uh, I wasn't home one time, and Dave was sitting there drinking, and my bass was on a guitar stand, and he decided to take a whole beer and just pour it right into the pickups on my bass, just down the whole thing in there. I didn't know anything about it. Go plug it in. About blew me across the room. It shocked the hell out of me. I told Dave, look, you guys get the F out of my house. James, get out. You're going to have to leave. I mean, that's it. I can't take it anymore. Within weeks, McGovney was out of the band. He just was not dangerous. You know, if you're going to be in Metallica, you're four badass. It's not, you know, three men and a baby, you know. They came in the U-Haul, 
loaded up their stuff, and they were off to San Francisco. Metallica moved their angry act to San Francisco and hired bass player Cliff Burton. The city by the bay soon became heavy metal headquarters. There were gods in San Francisco. We were selling three, 4,000 tickets to shows. They were legends before they ever released a record. We felt a lot more comfortable up there, and the whole flashy side of L.A. just wasn't so prominent up there, you know? On stage, Dangerous Dave was part of Metallica's instant attraction. I had a middle finger! <laughs> Dave was outspoken. Did a lot of talking into the microphone, which I thought was very unusual for a guy who was not singing at all. He was playing the role of bad boy. Uh, and he, he played it well. I mean, he was a pretty scary guy. It seemed to me like I was the leader of the band because I had big balls and I wasn't going to take shit from anybody. Metallica quickly drew allegiance from an underground army of angst-ridden teens already armed with the sounds of the new wave of British heavy metal. We were all followers of the new wave of British heavy metal. Metallica's music was kind of like these groups, but Americanized, more powerful, more straightforward. I had never heard like such a twin rhythm guitar kind of deal going on. Their music just had more speed or something to it, and it blew me away. You couldn't read about it in, in mainstream magazines. You couldn't hear it on the radio. There certainly was no MTV or, or videos or VH1. It was really about a network. By the beginning of 1983, Metallica had punched out a seven-song demo tape, No Life to Leather, that quickly became legendary in the American metal underground. What the music was speaking about, the lyrics and the lifestyle, that really hit home to a lot of kids for that time period. We are you and you are us. On the No Life to Leather demo, James says, we are Metallica, you are Metallica. And that was sort of the ethic that lived you know, with all these fans and all these bands. That March, aspiring metal manager Johnny Zazula heard the tape and convinced Metallica to move to New York. Are you planning to do any recording soon? May 1st, May 1st, Rochester, New York. With James Hetfield's pickup in tow, Metallica hit the road in a U-Haul. The back went down and you were locked in there and whatever happened back there, you know, if you could afford a flashlight, you were king, you know. But there was no light, no anything back there. You just get rotted and sleep, you know, hopefully. I hope the gear didn't fall and crush you. <laughs> While I was in the back of this truck, rust came down from the ceiling and got in my eyes. I said, I gotta get to an emergency room because I've got metal shavings in my eyes. And they didn't want to stop till we got to Old Bridge. Dave's dark side soon got the best of him. There's two kinds of drunks. There's happy drunks and there's violent drunks. And I would get violent. He just went like totally psycho on some people in this restaurant and almost caused this big fight. We started to see that he was on the road to killing possibly all of us. Before they even reached New York, James and Lars were listening to other bands' demos, hoping to find a replacement for Dave Mustaine. We're playing tapes in the cab of the truck while he's asleep in the back on some stained mattress. I mean, that was the whole ugliness of that U-Haul trip. Metallica arrived in New York in April of 83. Their first order of business was to rid themselves of Dave Mustaine. All I remember was waking up and then being circled around me, and I just looked up. Wake up, Dave, you know. Get up, you're, you're out of the band. And I said, what, no warning, no second chance? It was almost like execution style. We just walked in, woke him up, fired him, grabbed him in his shit, and took him down to the bus stop. And the whole thing took, you know, 45 minutes. It does sound <laughs> pretty bad, you know, wake up, bye. But it really had to happen that way. The breakup was hard on everybody. I remember this like it was yesterday. I was sitting in the back of James's pickup when they drove me to the bus station, and I looked at James, and he was weeping. You know, we were brothers up to that point, and then something had pulled us apart, and uh, we knew it had to continue that way, so it was emotional for all of us. I'd seen my dad in a coma and, and dying, and, and this was probably more harmful to me than anything I'd ever been through. Dave spent the next four days on a bus bound for Los Angeles, seething over his expulsion. I hated him. I, I was so mad at them, and I figured I need to regroup, and I need to start over again, because now I'm going to get revenge. Part of the whole reason why I formed Megadeth was to get back at them. Destroy 